let me just say happy new year again happy 2020 when i was a kid i thought by now we'd have flying cars anybody else i mean come on yo come on i'm driving a dodge where's my flying car come on <laughs> so many things i actually looked at a few of those uh, from the 70s where people wrote, you know, science fiction novels, and so many of them were set in 2020. It looks nothing like the real world that we're in, but it is what it is. And some of you saw my post on the socials uh, on New Year's Eve. I posted this, 2020, a new year, a new decade, but aren't you glad the same faithful God, he is with us and he is already before us. Oh, yes. So let me do what we have always done in the Haven Church. Just a little over four years old, but every January, that first Saturday, we gather together through times of praying and fasting and seeking God before that, as your pastor, as your brother, as your shepherd, as your friend, whatever role I play in your life connected to this ministry, I feel like God gives us a theme. And that theme is more than just a catchphrase or more than just a hashtag. It is a, a vision. It is a desire. It is so many things. And I feel like many, many weeks ago, the Lord confirmed that our theme for 2020 is momentum. Now, momentum is more than just movement. It's sustained movement. Momentum doesn't necessarily mean fast, but it means there is progress, something already in motion. You see, this ministry, by the grace of God and by your faithfulness and by what he's doing in all of our lives, we have been moving, not just physically and not just in numbers. Those are wonderful, but they're only part of the story. We have been moving in the spirit. In 2020, my heart's desire, and I feel like throughout the year, we'll continue reinforcing that we are in a year of momentum. We're going to keep moving, and we're going to continue to have a positive impact on others in 2020. Now, as you pray for your pastor in this church, keep this theme in mind throughout the weeks and the months ahead because we're all connected to this thing. Jesus is leading. The Holy Spirit is the fire and the engine. Uh, I, I, I may be holding the throttle, but he's in charge. I promise you that. And I just ask that as we continue to have an impact on others, that it is more than just within this room, but it is outside these walls. And I'll be illustrating it in various ways. I chose the Newton's cradle right there. I'm going to do some stuff with that in the weeks to come just to further illustrate what I'm feeling in my heart about this, this, this momentum for this ministry in this coming year. Now let me start with this verse. Some would call it a sober warning. I consider it a sober challenge. So we just understand that, that there's a bit of brevity to tonight. There's a, there's a little bit of a weight to this thing going on. And I, I want us to understand that Galatians 6, 7, a very famous popular verse, says, Do not be self-deceived. Don't fool yourself. God is not mocked, which means what he says is going to happen. His law, his precepts, his word, it is set in stone. Whether we believe it or not, God is not mocked. What he says is going to happen. And then it ends with a portion of scripture that many of us have said, either in context or out of context, whatever a person sows, this and this only is what they'll reap. Now that should not necessarily be seen as a negative. It can be, depending on what things you're allowing into your heart, into your life, because God says it's going to produce something. It's going to produce more of the same. But I see it on the other side, that we have a wonderful opportunity right from the beginning of this year of momentum to begin planting in our own hearts, our own lives, and, and in our experiences outside of this place some good seed that is going to produce good fruit. We have beds all around our house, those mulch beds. Somewhere in the early years of living there, I decided it would look nice to have that, that border of dark black mulch. I've regretted it every year ever since. I'd much rather mow right to the house than I have to do all this remulching and everything. It's crazy. But there's one part on one side of the house where about 10 years ago, Debbie decided she was going to have a garden. And she did a great job with it. We had tomatoes and we had cucumbers. And she also planted mint. Oh, I hear those groans of experience. 
So even though the garden is long gone, every single spring in that black mulch, there's green mint everywhere. Now the mulch isn't producing the mint. The seed that has long since fallen on that soil continues to produce. This is the spiritual principle that we can embrace this year. Let's allow good seed not only to go in our hearts, but also to go out from our lives. Speak life into others. Speak encouragement into others. That's sowing good seed into somebody's life. And the Bible says that's what will be reaped. We're going to start by throwing some really good seed tonight. Out of the Old Testament book of Judges. And I can promise you this. The seed we are going to sow into your heart not only tonight, but each week we're together, each small group. The seed we are going to sow into your life, into your eternal spirit, is good seed because it's God's seed. We're going to take that word and we are going to scatter it. And every week when you come in, ask God, say, Lord, make my heart fertile soil. Make it ground that's really soft and can take that seed and that somehow that will produce something good in my life. Every week we are going to sow good seed because you see we are moving. We are heading somewhere and part of that is closer to the heart of God. I believe that with all my heart. Now the section of the book of Judges where we are going to be basically in chapter 6, 7, and 8 for the most part for the next several weeks is going to deal with an Old Testament character. I love this guy. His name is Gideon. Some of you know of him. Some of you may not. We are going to discover so many things, and I believe it is going to help us incrementally continue to move forward in great momentum. Part one tonight, I simply want to call, who, me? Who, me? We're going to find that Gideon, like many of us, had some real issues with self-perception as opposed to God's perception of who he was. Now, I'm aware that many of us come from religious backgrounds that things were presented to us in quite a negative way. And that God was perhaps painted as a very, very angry old man who was always looking to somehow chastise you, always looking to have the hammer come down. But I hope you'll see as we go through this that seeing ourselves through God's lens is actually a beautiful thing. For he not only loves you and he not only cares for you, but he sees in you what you may not even know is there and yet has tremendous potential. You ever have somebody take a picture of you and you look at it and you say, that doesn't look like me. You ever done that? In this day of selfies, I'm always taking selfies and we're looking at the wrong place. The camera's over here. We're looking over there. The selfie's a little off. I'm a terrible picture taker. If you need some photography, uh, see somebody professional. Don't see your pastor. I have other gifts, but that's not one of them. But we've all had those experiences where whether it's a, a phone or whether it's a camera that we went into a situation and pictures were going to be taken and maybe we had a certain expectation that didn't quite get met. Maybe we thought these pictures were going to be awesome, but somehow they weren't so awesome. And all I can say about this one is, what is that? Who thought that was a good idea? It is so weird. Gave me the creeps. But here's the thing. With God's lens, there is no mistake. With God's lens, there is perfect clarity and perfect focus. And I believe Looking at this life of Gideon, especially as we begin tonight, you're going to realize that that doesn't always mean negative for you and I. That the perfect clarity of what God sees, the creator, the one who breathed life into you, the one that drew you in these seats by his spirit tonight, he sees amazing things in you. Judges chapter 6 is where we're going to start. Now right before this in chapter 5, one of the previous leaders of the Israelites had done a wonderful job. And God had blessed her. 
And chapter 5 ends with a song of praise. And scripture tells us at the very last verse of chapter 5 of Judges that Israel enjoyed 40 years of peace. 40 years of no war. 40 years of prosperity. 40 years where God was blessing and God was pouring in and everything that they planted came up wonderfully and, and everything that they invested in had a wonderful return and their children were being born healthy. 40 years of amazing blessings from God. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, somewhere toward the end of those 40 years, as a nation, they began to get complacent. As a nation, they began to forget who gave them those blessings. They began to neglect going and worshiping him and offering sacrifices to God in simple obedience. They didn't have time for God because life was too good. Somewhere in the end of those 40 years, they had, as a nation, almost as a whole, had abandoned their love and respect for the giver of every good and perfect gift. God our Father. Judges chapter 6, verse number 1 starts this way. After the 40 years of peace, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Now, the Midianites were a, a neighboring a, a society, a heathen, barbaric society, they were brutal. They were cruel. You say, how could God do that? Well, I can tell you through Scripture and knowing the heart of God and understanding and studying it and even expounding on it at times together, God will always send plenty of warnings before judgment comes. He will always draw us to His heart. He will always say, get this in order. Just like the seven letters of Revelation that we went through last year. God will always do His part to draw us and to wake us up. But somewhere, they refuse to listen. So God said for a limited time, for seven years, they're going to be hard years, but I am going to allow this to correct the course of my people. You say, how could these people be so ungrateful? How could the Israelites be, be so clueless and drift away? Before we say that with too much enthusiasm, please understand, according to Scripture, there's some of that in all of us. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, all of us. Any all of us in the house tonight? Yeah, that's every one of us. Every one of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's path to follow our own. Now, some of us, it's just a few moments. Some of us, it becomes a part of our life. Some of us are still in it tonight. But I will tell you this. God, understanding how sheep are, and we're all sheep, look back at me and say, bah. Only some of you did. Come on. Now listen, this is what God did. He said, I understand your sheep. I understand your stray. I understand it happens to all of us. You have that in your heart. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a provision. One of the reasons we celebrated Christmas with such gusto and such joy is because by Jesus coming, God laid on him all of our sins. So that even when we stray, we have an advocate to God the Father who will forgive us and put us back on the right track. So don't be too hard on them as we go through this tonight. Because we're all like sheep at times. Down in verse number 7. The Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Now God told them it's going to be seven years, it's going to be hard. But as this begins to get very cumbersome, the Midianites would do this, for example. They would allow Israel, they'd leave them alone during the time of planting and the time of weeding their crops and the time of feeding their, their livestock until everything was great. And then right when it was time for harvest, the Midianites would swoop in like a swarm of locusts, Scripture says, and they would take it all and disappear. They'd let Israel do all the work, and then they would come in. And every year, Israel would think, this year, that won't happen. This year, they'll leave us alone. But they kept coming back. It became grievous. It was their own doing. But God said, listen, even in my judgment, it's not going to last forever. And so finally, Israel cries out for help. Can I tell you what? That's a beautiful thing. 
wherever we're at in life. If you find yourself a little sheep that's straying a little bit tonight, listen to what Scripture says in James 4, 8. Come close to God, and He will come close to you. God sees our effort. And then he goes into more detail and basically says, wash your hands, you sinners, or, or get yourself right. Stop touching the things you shouldn't touch. Stop saying the things you shouldn't say. And stop having divided loyalty between God and the world. We're all going to struggle, but we can set a course and be determined. And God says, if you make your move, I'm coming. And I'm not coming to strike you down. I'm coming to help you. I'm so glad for God's help in my walk with him. So glad for God's patience in my walk with him. I'm so glad for God's mercy. So Israel strays. They cry out. God sends a message through an anonymous prophet that I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to send somebody that's going to help you be free of these mean, old, nasty Midianites. And guess who that's going to be? It's going to be a very obscure man named Gideon. Hitherto for in history, nobody had a clue. Nobody had heard his name except his own mama. And she gave him the name. So that's okay. Look what Scripture says now. Chapter 6, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord, which most theologians in my study believe the same, that this was actually God himself. He came and he sat beneath a great tree. Now, just to pause a sidebar as I'm reading this, I think, come on, God, they've disobeyed you. Come on, they absolutely uh, took for granted all your blessings. You're in the middle of judgment, and God doesn't come, and he's not upset, and he's not nervous. He's chilling under a tree. That's the goodness of God. He didn't come to destroy things. He came to rescue his people who cried out. Oh, can I tell you tonight, if you've drifted far, don't hesitate to cry out. God's not going to come and beat you up. He came and he sat under a tree. And what happens next? This guy Gideon, we're introduced to him for the first time in history. He's the son of Joash. And he's threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain, remember, from those Midianites who were always stealing it. So check this out. God knows how to find you. This obscure man nobody's heard of. He is about to be called by God to do something amazing. But he is in the most obscure place. He is down in a wine press and he is secretly and quietly threshing the weed so that some of it might not get stolen. Listen, God knows how to find you. I love this verse in Ezekiel. I'll just say this before I read it to you. If you've got loved ones that have strayed far from God and you've been praying for them, you might want to take a picture of this verse and pray this throughout the year. And stand on this promise. If you've got people in your life, maybe a spouse or somebody that is not where they need to be and you've been praying for them, this verse should lift your spirit and lift your heart. Ezekiel, the Lord speaks through the prophet and listen to what he says. I, God, will search for my lost ones who have strayed away. God says, I'm coming and I'm going to find them. I've said it before. We don't find God. God finds us. And he says, I will bring them safely home. Oh, somebody be encouraged in your faith tonight. That's our God. I will bandage the injured. Some of them are so beat up. God says, I'm going to do the bandaging. I'm going to heal them myself. I'm going to strengthen those who are weak. God knows how to find us and not to bring us down, but to bring us up. That's our God. You know, Jesus said, The Son of Man, who is Jesus, came to seek, which is actively pursue and save those who are lost. The heart of our God, He knows how to find you. He knows how to find your loved ones. God will pursue with love and grace and mercy. Here's what happens next. Let's go back. I'm going to look at this verse. Verse number 11. It says, where is he at? He's threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press. Here's what I see in this. Gideon was away from all distractions. Why is that important? It's hard to hear God's voice when you're surrounded by clamor. In my years married to this 
Puerto Rican princess on the front row. There have been many times, maybe not enough, but there have been many times where I'm just like, babe, we got to go out on a date. And I want to go somewhere, just you and me, someplace quiet and someplace romantic. And there have been a few times in our few years together where we've gone to places and just read the Yelp reviews and the food sounded great and everybody said it was so wonderful. And so we go there, we sit down, there's candlelight, but you notice something right away that the restaurant is extremely loud. You ever been in some of those? Where the way the hard structures are and the conversations, I'm sitting there, I can't even hear myself. We're, t- we're trying to have a conversation. Do you know how unromantic it is to scream compliments at your wife? We had people at the next table thought we were fighting. I said, we're just Italian and Puerto Rican. That's what happens. Same with God. It's hard for him to tell you how much he loves you. And it's always noise around you. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. Now, public prayer, corporate prayer, that's also part of God's will. We pray together here. We pray for people in need. That's a part of God's will. We pray together in small groups. But here's what Christ is saying, and I want to reinforce tonight for those of us that want that momentum to continue in 2020. Somewhere in your personal prayer life, you must have private time with God. It can't all be in a big group because you'll never really hear His voice as clearly That's when you develop that keen sense of listening to him one-on-one in isolation. Now, let me give you a version that's not quite very popular yet, and it hasn't been published, but I want to give you that same Matthew 6.6 in the scrim version, if I could do that. I am hoping to sell those one day and make a lot of money. But listen, here's what it says. Jesus said, when you pray, close your laptop. Turn off the music. Even Kanye. You didn't even know I knew who Kanye was, did you? Come on, yo. I'm hip. I used to be hip. I have a hip daughter. Okay, there's that. Turn off Netflix. Close the Facebook app. Turn off your phone, even though you may break out into cold sweats. Because of FOMO. You guys didn't know I knew what FOMO was, did you? Come on. You're you're afraid you're going to miss out on something. No, listen, Jesus is saying if you want to develop that sense of hearing, here is this man Gideon. He has no idea what's coming, but one thing's for sure. God found him, and the place that God talked to him was a place where he was all by himself. I encourage you this year. Let me give you a a rhyme. This may help reinforce it. Somebody might want to tweet this. You want to hear God's voice? Get away from the noise. Give him a chance to whisper your name. In the fireside chat, I use that scripture. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, wait a minute, a still, small voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Let me keep going. Verse number 12. Then the angel of the Lord, who was actually God himself, appeared to Gideon. He made himself absolutely visible, not just a voice. And he says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now you have to understand something. Based on the dialogue that's about to come, I can tell you this, that this young man who is hiding away down below in that wine press, when he looked in the mirror, he did not see a mighty hero. There is no way he thought of himself this way. But God said, I see the truth. And inside you, young man, and inside people in this room tonight, and those who will watch this video, There is something, there's a warrior, there's a fighter, there's an overcomer. You don't even know, but God says, if you let me, I'll show you. You can live that life of victory. Gideon was like, say what? I want to encourage you with this. 
God sees past our limitations. We all have them. We all have limitations. Can I tell you what? Some people say, I- I'm, I'm going to stay humble before God. Humility before God is not supposed to paralyze us from being involved or getting busy. You say, I, I just, I-, I don't have the background. I don't have the pedigree. I don't, I-, I don't have the education. I haven't been raised the same way. God sees a mighty warrior. He knows what's inside. I, I-, I love this. The story, the the miracle in Matthew chapter 14. And Jesus is preaching. And there's 5,000 men. When you count the women and children, there was probably 20,000 people there. And he's preaching and he's ministering and the people are getting hot and tired and they're getting hungry. Listen to me. Jesus says, What do we have to take care of these people? And in Matthew 14, 17 and 18, the disciples say, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here. Most of us know this beautiful story. But here's what happens. Jesus take what seems to be not nearly enough. And what's he do? He blesses it. He breaks it. He passes it out. He multiplies it. And he feeds the multitude to where everyone is not only full, but there's leftovers. Jesus is showing part of his heart here. God is showing us who he is. He doesn't necessarily need the whole package. Just give him what you got. Let him bless it. Let him multiply it. Let him use it. God is not limited by our limitations. But Lord, it's a couple of biscuits and some fish McNuggets. What are you going to do with that? Is there such a thing as a fish McNugget? No. So that I made up, okay? What are you going to do with that? God says, listen, I've been doing it from the beginning of time, taking what seems like not enough and making it enough. Somebody hear the Holy Spirit tonight for your life. God is not limited by what you see as your limitations. He wasn't with Gideon, and he is not tonight in this house. Let me keep going. Verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him, turned to Gideon, and he said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites, for I'm sending you. And Gideon still doesn't get it, has no idea how this is going to happen. He says, But Lord, how can I rescue Israel? And he goes to his family. Just look at my people, Lord. My clan or my family is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least of my entire family. He's saying, I'm the least of the least. I'm so insignificant. You have got the wrong guy. Lord, why? Why me? Can't happen. Impossible. Your family background neither qualifies nor disqualifies you from being used by God. Your education neither qualifies or disqualifies you from being used by God. The length of time that you have known him does not disqualify or qualify you from being used by God. He can use each one of us where we're at and continue to develop that momentum to where it gets greater and greater. I'm living that, folks. That is my story tonight. God says to Gideon, go with the strength you have. You say, it's just, it's not enough. If you say that tonight, you are in really good company. Not only in this room, but also throughout history. The people that have said, God, what I I got... I don't have enough strength. You think I do, but I don't think I do. I I love this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 10. For when I am weak in human strength and ability, which seems like way too often. Anybody understand how that feels? When I am weak, then I am strong. And the word strong there in definition means this. Truly able 
truly powerful, truly drawing from God's strength. Listen, you have enough strength through Christ. We started this service, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. We live in a very self-motivated and, and, and a very much intense culture, especially in New Jersey. Always pushing, always striving, and that's okay. It's good to want to wanna get ahead. It's good to work hard. But there comes a point where you and I will hit the wall. And tonight, I'm hoping we will see that only through the strength and the ability of Christ. He looks at us with that lens tonight, and he says, Oh, I see, I see something you don't even know is there. I see enough strength. I see more than enough. I shared a story a couple of years ago. I've not shared it since. Many of you were not with us then, and I feel like either way it's, it'll illustrate to you tonight that I'm not just preaching this, but I'm absolutely living this. When you look at God and you say, who, me? See, some of us, our feelings of inferiority are caused by words that have been spoken into our life by others. Maybe parents, maybe relatives, maybe spouses, maybe people at school. I don't know, but so many times those words, they take root in our lives and they produce that, that bad fruit. Some of us, our, our feelings of being inadequate tonight are because things that people have poured into our life. I get it. About six or seven years ago, I was in an organization, a religious organization, and I was pursuing being a pastor through that organization. And I was paying my dues, so to speak. And I was taking the courses, and I was going to the conferences, and I was serving in various churches throughout that organization, and I felt like God was continuing to draw me to be a pastor, something I never wanted to be. I have good friends of mine that remember when before the word pastor, I would always include the word never. Don't try that with God too much. He knows how to bring us around to his way. So I began to feel that in my heart. Because six or seven years ago, I decided I got to meet with the, with the top of the organization. I got to see how I got to get to this place. I got to find some church, a little church somewhere that, that wants a pastor. And, and my beard wasn't as long then, so I thought, maybe I got a shot. And I meet with this gentleman, high up, the top as it gets. And I sat in his office. And I'm on the other side of his big desk. He didn't come around and sit next to me. He sat behind his desk. It was all... I don't want to say it was all optics, but that was some of it. I'm sitting there. He's over there, and I begin to pour in my heart. I said, sir, I'm doing all I can, and I don't want to rush things, and I don't want to get ahead of God, and I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I'm telling you, sir, I'm not getting any younger. The fire is burning. I got the energy, the passion. I'm doing the education. I'm studying. I'm doing all this stuff. I, I, I got to find a church somewhere that I can just, you know, help out or try to help out or, or, or just lead them closer to God in this walk. And he threw out a few questions, and they were kind of set-up questions, and I knew I didn't exactly answer them the way he wanted me to. I, I sensed it in that room that this was not going very well, and my heart was so heavy. I wanted to scream to him, I don't want to be here. God brought me here. And at one point, he rolled back from his desk, and he said, Paul... I got a drawer right here, and he pulls it out. He says, it's all hanging folders and files, and this drawer is filled with churches within my jurisdiction looking for a pastor, and it was full. And he pulled this drawer out, and he said, Paul, these hanging files here are resumes of pastors looking for a church, and I'm thinking, why is that drawer so full? When that drawer's so full, put them together. Instead, I said to him, I said, sir, you got all of that going on, and I'm sitting in front of you. You got to tell me, where do I fit? And he looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, Paul, you don't fit anywhere. Whoa. 
pierced my heart. Pierced my heart. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Just give me some out of the way, please. Just give me some little, little trick. Give me some, give me some. There's nowhere. I left that so discouraged. I left there thinking, God, if he's right, maybe he's right. I began to have all this self-doubt. I began to say to myself, the man has so much experience, and after all, he's pulling all the strings, and I'm, I'm just on the outside looking in. And somewhere as I poured my heart out to God, and I said, just tell me yourself, and I'll leave this whole pursuit, and I'll go back to playing music or something. And God led me to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 27. Somebody hear the heart of God tonight through this bearded preacher. But God has selected for his purpose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing or exposing their ignorance. And God has selected or hand-chosen or hand-picked for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong but in fact are exposed to be frail. Can I tell you tonight, it doesn't matter what people have spoken into your heart and your life. The only words that matter are God's words. And he says, I see you. I found you. Give me time to talk and I'm going to lead you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to confound those that think they have all the answers. And I can tell you, pressing through and understanding that it doesn't say, but man has selected. Oh, I'm glad it didn't say that. It says God has selected. And I realized, look, if he had his hand on my life and my heart, then how about I just follow him? Somewhere in the summer of 2015, this wonderful thing called the Haven Church was birthed. Despite all the negative, despite all the naysaying, despite all those that would bring me down, God said, I will lead you and I will bless you. Think of it this way. That scripture says it's according to God's purpose. Church, listen, if it's his purpose, then he decides who's qualified. You are qualified tonight to say yes to God. You are qualified tonight to say, use me, God. You are qualified. You're sitting here in his presence. You're qualified to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. I think maybe what I want to do tonight, I think I want to just give you a few minutes. In this quiet, wonderful atmosphere, to just pray this yourself to God. Say, here I am, Lord. I, I may not have all the, the resume and the background and the pedigree, but here I am, Lord. And before we do, I want you to consider something that hit me today as I was studying. Remember that place in Scripture where I told you about the feeding of the multitude? Think of it this way. Jesus is standing there. 20,000 people are starving. Jesus is God. He was there at creation. Did you ever wonder why Jesus didn't just say, I'm going to create a buffet table. Let there be golden corral. Think about it. He could have done it. He could have, had, he could have had lunches popping up everywhere. But instead we see his heart tonight. His heart for you and I. And that is, I will take that little bit. I choose, God says, to use what you give me. I choose to take that which seems insignificant. Oh, my goodness. I'm living this, folks. God says, I'll take it. And I will feed others with it. I'll bless others with it. I'll, I'll, I'll shine in this world with it. If we'll just say, God, it's not much. God chose to use what was given to him. What will you give him tonight? 
on this first service of 2020. What will you give him tonight? So I'm just going to play for a few minutes. And what I'd love for you to do is just maybe close your eyes. Want to just stare somewhere, that's fine. Just find some kind of focus. And, and somewhere in these quiet moments, just say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Here's my loaves and here's my fishes. Do not pass me by. Come on, take some time right now. tonight 
not for condemnation. So you'd understand. Go in the strength you already have. Start with what he's given you. Start with the experience so far. Let him build that. Let him grow that. Let that be the momentum that takes you closer and closer to his heart. Father, I pray a blessing on each one. The broken heart, the guarded heart, the distant heart, oh God, the doubting heart. Thank you for encouraging us tonight. And I pray, Father, that each one of us would find that place of quietness to shut out the distractions and hear your still, small, precious, and loving voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Bless our time of fellowship. Bless the rest of this night at the Haven Church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I love you guys. I love you guys. God bless you.